Good evening and welcome to another edition of our COVID-19 pandemic update on Channels Television in collaboration with the Ford Foundation. I'm Millicent Walker. Here are some of the highlights this hour. Today, PTF briefing holds worries over increasing spread of infections among health workers nationwide. In the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, how do journalists practice without fear? That's our theme this evening. And Channels Television donates palliatives to the Lagos State Government for onward delivery to the vulnerable in society. U.S. and U.K. researchers discover recurring COVID-19 mutations. Well, against the backdrop of famine, conflict zones, elections, protests, journalists are on the front line covering the stories that matter. And certainly this coronavirus pandemic is not left out with journalists disseminating information and educating the public on the dangers of COVID-19. But just like health workers, some of them have been caught up, infected with the virus, while others relentlessly cover high risk areas to get the people's stories and most times the help they need. On our theme this evening, we look at the new normal for journalists and the task to stay above the fake news and provide fair and balanced perspectives in the midst of a global pandemic. Now, 2,950 COVID-19 cases, that is the number of confirmed cases in Nigeria following the confirmation of 148 new cases by the Nigeria Centre for Disease Control, NCDC, last night. According to the centre, 481 patients have been discharged from various isolation centres and 98 deaths recorded. Currently, Lagos remains a state with the highest infections both in the southwest and the country, with a total of 1,226 cases, followed by Kano in the northwest with 397 cases. Next is the Federal Capital Territory in the North Central with 307 cases. Bornu has the highest figure in the Northeast with 106 cases. Edo leads the South South with 65 cases and eight cases, Enugu leading the Southeast. And now, uh, Babajido Gusonwa, Channel's Television's data analyst, is here with us. Good to see you. It's always great to be here. All right. Now, uh, let's talk about Kano. There seem to be major concerns in that city. Uh, this is from its first index case to the number that we have in Kano. Everyone is curious about it. Here's the challenge. Um, Ch Kano currently has 307 cases. Lagos has 1,226 cases. What does this mean? Lagos and Kano account for 55% total number of coronavirus cases we've seen in this country as of today. In other words, one out of every two persons that has the coronavirus is either living in Lagos or Canada. We've seen a lot of focus um, on Lagos, but here's why we need to be concerned about what is going on in Kano. The first is there's been a misunderstanding about Kano. There's a myth that Kano is the largest state in the Northwest, but the evidence we have today from the Borders Commission shows that among the seven states in the Northwest, Kano, right. Kaduna, Katsina, Kebi, Jigawa, Sokoto, and Zamfara, Kano State has the smallest land <laughs> over 3,000 square kilometers. So Kano is the smallest state when it comes to land area, but when it comes to population in the Northwest, Kano, yes, has the largest population. So the summary is the challenges we face in Kano is not because of the size of Kano in terms of land area, right. but it's because of the population density. We've got the largest population in Northwest, which is Kano State, and they also have Kano State, that's what I mean, Kano State also has the smallest land area. So the concerns about the coronavirus in Kano is because of its population density. A lot of people living within that small... Do, do you fear that there might be more spread of cases, more cases in the future for Kano? For kind of the key word is prevention. The government needs to focus on preventive steps than um, curative steps. Because of that population concerns, over, <coughs> excuse me, over 20 million people. And here's why um, the government needs to act fast. Because the evidence shows that more than half of those that are living in Kano, 57% are below the age of 18. So we see a lot of 
young young population in Kano, and we see a lot of other interesting facts that we need to and the government needs to use in planning its response. One thing that the government needs to also understand is the peculiarity of of Kano. Unlike Lagos, where we have a lot of families in the urban areas, Kano, seventy three percent of families in Kano live in the rural areas. areas, and that is how they need to really understand and and, and act towards minimizing the spread of the virus in, in Kano. One concern again is how do families react to the information that the government is, is spreading or you know, sharing about the coronavirus in Kano. A lot of families in Kano do not believe about the coronavirus. So the question is, why aren't families really in tune and why do they not believe what is going on in Kano? And the answer is here. 49% of the head of households in Kano do not have any formal education. That's a better way to understand it, Millicent, is to look at it from another perspective, and that is almost one in every two family head in Kano has no formal education. So it's quite difficult for them to really believe that there's a coronavirus that is killing, killing them in Kano. All right, we'll be taking a look. I mean, all eyes will be on Kano in the coming days. And this is hoping, of course, that uh, the country can find a way to stop the spread of COVID. Thank you, Baba today. One other interesting way to stop the spread is also by looking at how we minimize the poverty rate in Canada. All right, well, let's take you to the PTF briefing. The country is not close to lifting the ban, it says, on international flight operations yet, as the presidential task force today gave a four-week extension on the flight entry ban. The secretary to the government of the federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa, also used the occasion to warn against the level of non-compliance currently being experienced nationwide. In view of the fact that public transportation is a major cl clustering area through which the virus can easily be transmitted, we call on the leadership of various transport unions to properly enlighten their members on the dangers associated with non-adherence to the COVID-19 containment guidelines. We also urge them to educate their members on the ban imposed on interstate travels. Tomorrow marks the last day for the enforcement of the closure of Nigeria's airspace to flights. We have assessed the situation in the aviation industry and have come to the conclusion that given the facts available to us and based on the evidence of experts, the ban on all flights will be extended for an additional four weeks. I wish to repeat my call to the banks to also quickly address issues related to difficulty with using their online platforms, especially revalidating expired ATM cards, amongst others. Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Hanire, the situation in Kano highlights the need to give intensive training to healthcare professionals in the country. He confirms the ministry will send supporting teams to different states to consolidate their efforts. The reported cases of infection in Kano are a case in point showing the urgent need for intensifying training, particularly among healthcare workers. It is clear that many doctors and nurses who are not familiar with the protocol for the infections of this caliber will benefit from the training. Community mobilizers have been deployed at the grassroots to continue to sensitize our people through the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. We are encouraging and supporting states to increase the number of isolation centers nationwide and also the quality of the isolation centers. And we're extremely grateful to corporate organizations and philanthropists who have donated isolation facilities, diagnostic equipment, commodities, and sundry supplies relevant to our response effort, our effort to COVID-19 threat. 
Now, there's been a slight delay in the return of Nigerians voluntarily returning to the country from the United Arab Emirates as a chartered plane conveying them made a U-turn to base after a pregnant woman was uh, delivered of a baby on board with some complications. The chairman of the Nigerian in Diaspora Commission confirmed to Channel Television that the plane, which was scheduled to arrive 3 p.m., had to make a return uh, to, for the woman to get medical attention. She explains that she's currently being treated in a Dubai hospital while the Nigerian ambassador in Dubai and officials of the embassy are in touch with the mother and child who are said to be in good condition. The plane conveying the voluntary returnees are now expected to arrive in Nigeria at 7 p.m. Well, according to the World Press Freedom Ranking, Nigeria moved up five steps, ranking 115 among 180 countries. According to Reporters Without Borders, Nigeria moved up five steps from 120. However, the report notes that Nigeria is one of West Africa's most dangerous and difficult countries for journalists who are often spied on, attacked, arbitrarily arrested or even killed. Well, we zero in on our theme this evening as frontline journalists, how they cope or they're coping under the coronavirus virus pandemic. And joining us on the program is Mr. Chris Isuguzo, the president of the Nigeria Union of Journalists, NUJ. Thank you for joining us at this time. Tell us, journalists are frontline workers as well as they battle the pandemic, creating awareness, disseminating information. What challenges is, uh, would you say are peculiar uh, to journalists at such a time as this? Well, at this uh uh, time, uh, you've already captured it. The journalists, we are on the front line uh, in the ongoing effort uh, to contain the spread of uh, uh, this uh, virus. As I speak, we have about uh, three journalists in the isolation uh, centers uh, in Katsina, in Sokoto, and of course in Adamawa. A journalist, uh, uh, we've lost one in Sokoto, the journalist working with uh, one of the uh, newspapers in the country. Uh, we've lost him as a result of uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, clearly, uh, just like uh, the health workers, the journalists, uh, we are on the front line because uh, we, the nation is uh, clearly looking up to us uh, to inform, uh, educate them, enlighten them, and of course, mobilize them as uh, far as this uh, rampaging pandemic uh, is concerned. And uh, being on the front line, there is no way a good coach uh, will leave his uh, playmaker on the sideline or sitting on the bench when you are facing a uh, very formidable uh, opposition. Uh, the journalists, the media workers, we are like the playmakers and we cannot be relegated uh, uh, to the background. Uh, we must be there and that's why we're on the front line and uh, facing uh, uh, this challenge at this uh, critical point in time is indeed not the best of time. But uh, we cannot uh, uh, leave the pitch because the opposition is uh, very, very uh, stiff. Solution. It's also a lot of personal risks of exposure. Um, we hear that some have been infected as well and, and also violations of their rights uh, from state and non-state actors. I mean, only yesterday, our business correspondent was harassed and violated uh, while in the line of duty. And we see this all the time during elections as well. Can we anticipate government protection uh, while also remaining independent? Well, uh, uh, you've uh, made reference to uh, the report released by Reporters Without Borders, uh, which uh, uh, placed us on the 115 on the Global uh, uh, Press Freedom Index. And that uh, clearly speaks volume, because when you compare it uh, with uh, other African countries, you see that uh, Nigeria is uh, far, far behind in terms of uh, uh, safety and security of journalists, in terms of... Uh, uh, press freedom. And that's why we are appealing to government and, of course, state actors, like you uh, uh, call them, that uh, this is uh, uh, the time for us, for them, actually, uh, to uh, uh, ensure that we are safe and secured because uh, we are playing a very, very interesting uh, role at this uh, critical point in time. Uh, we cannot afford not to be, you know, safe at this time. We've uh, received reports across the country, uh, in the FCT, uh, across the states, of how state actors are harassing uh, journalists uh, that are on duty, 
And uh, this is uh, very, very uh, condemnable uh, because uh, we are all supposed to be uh, partners in progress. We are stakeholders in, this, in the fight uh, against uh, this uh, deadly you know, pandemic. And the state actors must have to come to terms uh, with this uh, uh, reality. Uh, they cannot continue to treat us as uh, foreigners, a, a case of we versus them. No, all of us are involved. The health workers, uh, the journalists, the security operatives, all of us must have to team up in order to ensure uh, that uh, we contain this uh, pandemic. A situation where we keep receiving reports of attacks uh, on, our, on our security. Uh, you know, we are moving, uh, they, are, they are clamping down on us, uh, intimidating us, you know, harassing us. This is not good uh, for uh, a democratic uh, system. So I want to once again appeal uh, to those saddled with the responsibility of ensuring security and safety of journalists to please up the ante because we cannot continue to be receiving all these uh, incessant attacks. All right. Well, we'd like to appreciate your time, the president of the Nigeria Union of Journalists, Mr. Chris Suguzo. Thank you for joining us on the program. Still to come on our COVID-19 update on the second half of the program, we discuss domestic violations in Nigeria following the directives on COVID-19. Join us again. <laughs> Multiple award-winning station channels television media group today donated a truckload of food items to the Lagos state government for distribution to the most vulnerable group in the state. The items include 100 bags of 50 kilograms of rice, 300 bags of 25 kilograms of rice, 250 cartons of noodles, 250 cartons of spaghetti, and 75 cartons of vegetable oil. This is part of Channel's television's corporate social responsibility in the area of this pandemic. The state government says it is appreciative of the gesture. Now, the United Nations has warned of a shadow pandemic with rising reports of physical and verbal abuse in homes around the world because of the coronavirus lockdowns. In Nigeria, domestic and sexual violence experts say they have seen an increase in the number of people asking them for help. The Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Team says it has added extra handlers on its hotlines to cope with the number of calls that they are getting, according to the report. Victims are literally walking on eggshells because they don't know how their partner is going to react during this period. Well, let's trace the heightened number of domestic violations in Nigeria during the lockdown period. Mr. Harry Obey, Director, Legal, Human Rights and Protection Activist, Department of Women, Children and Vulnerable Groups, uh, the National Human Rights Commission, uh, joins us from Abuja Studios. Good to see you. Hope you're staying safe. Um, tell us about the statistics of the number of domestic violence cases in Nigeria, especially during the government-instituted lockdown. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to be here. Well, um, if you recall, at the onset of the lockdown, the National Human Rights Commission actually issued an advisory and informed the public that the commission was going to be monitoring the activities of law enforcement officers, particularly with regard to enforcing the restrictions. So our initial um, focus was on the um, activities of law enforcement uh, personnel. But we realized shortly into the um, uh, uh, activities that there was so much report coming in about sexual and gender-based violence, especially within the domestic space. Um, like the people usually before this pandemic, we get complaints through working uh, complainants and a few through our online media uh, channels. But because of the social distancing and the lockdown, we had to restrict complaints to, through electronic um, uh, means. And so we started getting those complaints. Um, from the 
chart you had or showed earlier, you recall that um, from gender and women perspective alone, we have a whole chunk of complaints, um, over 42,000 um, regarding domestic violence alone. But when we open the lines for specific report on domestic violence, aside monitoring the activities of law enforcement agencies, within the space of less than two weeks, we got direct reports on those media online of about 20, 20 direct reports on domestic violence. And the breakdown, we actually should solid into that. Some about rape of minors, uh, rape of um, adults, then some about other assaults and uh, torture and things like that. So it's really mind blowing and um, it is not uh, really unexpected when we reflected on it because the space for activities for humans are now actually reduced. And so a lot of people that were managing within the domestic space before now had to contend with face-to-face -face confrontations from spouses and also partners. And so that led to some physical uh, violence by both parties, but more against um, if, women, if I might come in, um, Mr. Obe, um, also looking at you know all that you have said, some people fear that perhaps the reports might also it might be underreported, seeing as some families try to manage things themselves or religious or a, a traditional methods. So, in terms of solutions, what do you think we should start looking at? Do, does the government need to get involved? Is there more sensitization? What exactly? Yeah, uh, definitely everyone has to get involved, particularly the government, to sensitize people on the need for them to speak out when they are experiencing uh, domestic violence. And we see that domestic violence is something that has to do with the arrangement of this, the whole society itself. So a lot of layers of intervening uh, actors come in, the church, the families, and all that try to settle it. And most times before we get to hear about it, it's almost too late. So people need to be aware that you have to be alive to be able to play your role within any space in the society, particularly within the family and the domestic spheres. All right, Mr. Harry Obey, Director, Legal Human Rights Protection Activist with the National Human Rights Commission. Thank you for joining us on the program. You're welcome. Thank you, too. The US and UK researchers say they have identified hundreds of mutations to the virus that causes COVID-19. None has, however, established yet what this will mean for virus spread in the population and for how effective a vaccine might be. Another study from the University College London has identified 198 recurring mutations to the virus. This comes amid rising number of cases and death toll from the coronavirus. And the NCDC continues to work closely with states. You can find the latest national strategy to scale up access to coronavirus disease testing in Nigeria, also other public health advisory. The website comes alive with all the information and regular updates. Also, the light feed of the World Health Organization's website. Each moment, there are regular updates, uh, the strategies, also the public health response. So you can take a look at some of the guidance, uh, guidance there for strategic action. And that's our COVID-19 special edition on Channels Television in collaboration with the Ford Foundation. Thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker. Another update comes your way again at 9 p.m. Stay safe.